Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keens with goldsilverpros.com and I have a very special first time guest joining us on the program. It is Jonathan Wiesbot, who's a Chief Executive Officer of Rock Ridge Resources, joining us today to talk about his project up in Canada, the two projects that they have, and one which are actively drilling out on a gold project. We're very excited about this to bring this to the market. Uh, John, thank you for joining the program. My pleasure, Robert. Happy to uh, be a first time uh, participant on your show, your program. Uh, Absolutely. And thank you for joining. Uh, one of the reasons, you know, we wanted to have you on the program, we're very interested in your project is because you have a couple of different projects going on. One's a polymetallic project with some copper and gold and some other things in it. And then you have a fully owned gold project as well. We want to get into those for just a moment. But since you're joining the program this time, I know that when people are looking in the equity space and looking to invest, the first thing that they look at really are the management teams. So I wanted to introduce you and talk a little bit about your background and how you got started with, with Rockridge. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've spent uh, the first two decades of my career uh, really on the investment management side of, uh, of the industry. Uh, at first, I was a sell side a research analyst. Um, some of the companies that I covered were in the resource space. So from a very early um, early days was writing up and recommending um, resource companies to institutional investors. And I was able to leverage some early success in those days as, uh, as an analyst, an equity analyst to the buy side. Moved over to the buy side um, pretty early on in my career and didn't leave until, you know, in and around uh, the COVID timeframe. And uh, over the, the 15 years plus on the buy side, I worked on a, a number of different products. So uh, multi-strategy um, alternative uh, investments uh, like a hedge fund. I worked on a product like that for over a decade um, and then um, worked on a, a long, a very well-known long only mutual fund up here in, in Canada. Um, it was a fund that was formerly managed by a very famous institutional investor here in Canada that I had the opportunity to, uh, to, to, work, uh, to, to work for and, and under and then eventually take on that product. And then for uh, a large family, family office, I worked in um, for a, a number of years. Um, at the latter points of my time as a portfolio manager, I was introduced to one of the founders of Rock Ridge. And at that point in time, I, I believe it was um, you know, 2020, 2021 timeframe. So in the, the midst of, of COVID, um, for the previous five years, I hadn't made an investment in precious metals um, just for a number of fundamental macro oriented reasons. And I had started to, on the onset of the, the COVID pandemic, I had started to make my very first foray back into uh, precious metals to start and then layering in some base metals. And I was also part of my macro thesis. It was driven mostly by you know, the, the, the scarcity of, um, of, of resources and the underinvestment in supply and then the pending growing demand once we were going to come out of the pandemic. So started buying um, some base metals and precious metals and that seemed to be the, the right trade. And at that point in time was looking for a way to, you know, increase my, my career and my, my personal um, interests into the resource space. And I met again one of the founders of Rockridge. We um, we had a meeting of the minds. We we shared you know our views on the the global macro. And Rockridge had two um, very interesting assets for for me. Um, one was uh, VMS Copper Play right here in Canada, Northern Saskatchewan. And geography is very important um, for my overall investment thesis for, on resource companies. I'll, we can touch on that in a second. And then the second foundational asset was. Um, a high-grade gold play here in my backyard in Ontario, um, 110 kilometers southwest of Timmins. As you know, the uh, that part of the world is responsible for a very large amount of total gold production um, produced uh, globally. Um, you know, uh, over time. So, two wonderful assets, a great management team, a very sophisticated um, and impressive board. And it was a great opportunity for me to come in and, and start to help to drive value and build value for, for shareholders in Rockridge. Yeah, very interesting background. And I noticed that with a lot of the mining companies, a lot of the leadership teams will have either financial experience or ge geology experience, scientific experience. And those seem to be the two you know, biggest qualifications for running a mining company, which makes total sense. But I, I understand the geologists getting into it because they love the rocks and they love that. And that's kind of their passion. 
I'm always fascinated to hear stories of people that came from more of the financial, the money side and why they got into resources, because there are a lot of sexy industries out there. I mean, you could be investing in, you know, Google and, and Apple and Tesla, and certainly those get a lot of investment. But to see people come from the money side and be interested in the resource space, I find very interesting. Why did you pick that space and, and why was that so interesting to you, given your background? So let's start with my, I think you got to start with the macro and my overall thesis, predominantly on the copper space, because re really the flagship asset, we have two foundational assets, but I like to talk about Knife Lake, our RVMS mm -hmm. copper plays as our, as our foundation, as our core asset. Um, so no Northern Saskatchewan, right place, you know, number two mining uh, jurisdiction based on the Fraser Institute's uh, recommendation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when we look at why, why we, why I like copper is you've had a lack of investment capex in infrastructure for more than a decade now. And so supply continues to be constrained. Plus the vast majority of copper production, as you and your audience will know, comes from um, less, um, I guess, less credible uh, mining jurisdictions than Canada globally. So parts of Latin America, areas in Africa, just places where the you know, the, the socio-political environments are less conducive for, uh, for operations over a long period of time. And so with, when you combine supply, tight supply, with the pending and emerging and demand growth coming from themes like the decarbonization of the global economy and the increase in the, the global electric, electrification of the auto fleet, um, there's a number of reasons to get really excited about the prospects for copper. Um, we expect to see that um, that supply demand equilibrium come out of whack as early as next year. And so when you talk about um, the macro and my, you know, very um, aggressive views on the price for copper, you know, what, what better place to, uh, to go and look for good assets than here in Canada and Knife Lake is, is certainly one of those. We can talk about the specifics of Knife Lake in just a second. And then when you layer in the overall, um, you know, price for gold, which has been advancing in recent months. We've, you know, gone over $2,000 per ounce USD, you know, three times now and still testing that 2050 level. But if you look at the macroeconomic environment for, um, for gold, it's, it's shaping up for, you know, a very, very good environment over the coming years. We have the collapse of um, very large banking and financial institutions here in North America. We have, you know, a war that continues to go on in Central and Central Europe and, you know, a number of other reasons to be very, very um, interested in gold. So when you combine the macro views for the base metal, specifically copper and the macro views that we have for the price of gold, there was a very, very easy way for me um, to make a decision to join a company that has exposure to both of those asset classes, which is Rockridge. Yeah, those are really, really good points, and and I want to explore those more. And and something uh, I'm going to hint here that we may get to at the end of the the interview is talking also about the changes in the economic landscape as well. From you know the Western world maybe morphing from a, a service based economy into some more traditional uh, or the expansion of some traditional elements of the economy which haven't been present in the last forty or fifty years. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk more about your projects, however, because I'm really interested in them. Talk a little bit about Rainy. I know that you guys have had some news come out lately. This is your 100% owned gold project up there in Canada, which is in a really nice historic area. There's been a lot of production and camps around it. You guys are starting an exploration program. If you could outline for the audience exactly what you're going to do with Rainy and um, you know what, what that exploration program is going to do for you. For sure. So let me just start off by saying that um, we're in the, the right uh, real estate. So we're the, the best neighborhood for, for gold production, um, perhaps uh, in the world is, is right here in, in, in that area of Ontario. Um, we are 100% uh, owned Rainy Gold Project is about 110 kilometers southwest of Timmins. Um, about 35 kilometers from Rainy is the, the Newmont Borden mine, which went into production in 2019, I believe. And we're also really on strike with I Am Gold's Cote project, which is uh, an, a seven to eight million ounce deposit of a very, very high grade gold. Um, so again, right neighborhood. So what are we up to now? We are conducting um, a drilling program with a minimum of 2,000 to 2,500 meters. So we're looking to drill approximately 10 diamond drill holes. 
we're looking to really expand the strike, the depth and the expansion potential of the high grade zones that were previously discovered. Um, our last drilling campaign at Rainy was back in 2020. Um, we're looking at um, you know, following up on some of the very good intersections from that program, including a hole back in 2020 that um, intersected 28 grams per ton over six meters. So again, right location and you know, indications of some of the high grade that other companies have discovered. So we'd like to follow up there. And then more specifically, we're looking to test the eastward and the westward continuity of the main rainy gold zone. So some of these um, deposits um, alterations are associated with gold mineralizations that are coincident with a mag low signature. So we'd really like to, to go in and, and test the, the structure, the alteration, and follow up on some of the successes of, of the past. The other thing about Rainy and the location that we're in, and one of the reasons why we've decided to allocate capital to that particular project is because of the cost of exploration in this part of the country. Um, it is significantly um, less expensive to drill in areas um, where Rainy is like, like Rainy, where infrastructure is incredible. You know, we have road access. We, we don't have to set up and build camp. Um, and drilling expenditures um, are significantly lower than they otherwise would be, you know, in some of our other projects um, across the country. So, um, you know, really exciting uh, discovery potential in the right neighborhood. It, the allocation of capital decision because of the, the cost efficiencies are there. So those are uh, some of the reasons why we're going back to Rainy. Um, I should also mention that the program is fully funded. We just raised uh, enough money um, in flow through and hard dollars to go in and, and really uh, you know, dig in and, and hopefully follow up on a successful 2020 program. Right. So do you think that that program will be done this year? What is, what is the time frame for that program? And then kind of set the picture, maybe blow it up just a little bit and not ask yeah. you to prognosticate because you're, you're, you're going to react to the drill program, but you're going to have this drill program. What happens after that? And just generally in the stage of this, of this project. Yeah, for sure. So the first phase of our project, so the 2000 to 2500 meters is mm -hmm. currently underway. Um, so we, we have started to, uh, to explore and depending on the results and the success of that program, we would consider expanding to a phase two and up to, you know, 4,000 or 4,500 meters. Now, let me put 4,000 meters of drilling at Rainy into perspective. That would increase total um, drilling exploration by greater than 45%. This is an area that has been underexplored and given the, um, the successes of some of the prior results, we think that there's incredible optionality and upside um, and the prob probability of success is quite high. Yeah, it seems like some of the factors are de-risked up front because you know you're in a, in a good camp, you know you've had you know, some preliminary work done, you know there's something there and you guys are basically following the geology to get down to it. Typically, how, well, how long does it take to develop one of these projects? Um, I, I know that development of these projects can take time. You do the drill holes, you explore what you have. Eventually, you may end up getting to like a feasibility study or something like that. Outline for people where you are in the general uh, life cycle of a miner. I think you guys are more toward the beginning of the end where you're really discovering what you have. So if you pull up one of those famous charts, which uh, is the, the development life cycle of a mine, we are at yeah. that very exciting, um, you know, early stage portion, the exploration phase, mm -hmm. where you get that really nice, if you're successful, you get that really nice uh, growth in, in equity value appreciation. Mm -hmm. And so the exploration phase, depending on the success and depending on your ability to, to finance, raise capital and continue to explore, yeah. um, that can take probably, you know, anywhere from... 18, 24, 36 months. So if you measure your, your ability to um, develop and discover uh, a, an economic resource in, in years. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're on that very exciting um, early stage uh, part of the process there. Yeah. And then when you get into the, the feasibility stage, the mine planning, the development, that's probably, you know, another couple of years followed by the construction of your, of your, of your mine. 
Um, and so you're, you're looking at a process that can take, you know, four or five, six years from start to finish. So I think we are at the very early, but most exciting um, part of that process. Yeah, and that's the point I want to emphasize. It's great to get in on projects which are, which are already there, but you lose a lot of your capital appreciation, you know, as an investor when you get in. So one of the reasons I'm so excited about this is you guys have the makeup of a very successful company, but you're so early stage. But there are some predictors there that you can kind of see that you guys have a lot to work with. It's not like you're going out to a bunch of greenfield areas and you're just putting holes in the ground, you know, like you might see in a TV show trying to find the goal. You guys are, you know, in an area which has had production. You've had some early success. And what you're doing is, is developing based upon that. And for investors, that's really the sweet spot of where you want to get in. If you're going to invest in this sector, these are good projects to get into. Uh, you look at a few of these types of companies that have these success factors early on, you know, you put some money into it and you let those companies develop it, but that's where you get your, most of your, your wealth or your run, if you will, as an investor, that's where you're going to get your return. So a little bit different than investing in, in more senior companies, but the senior companies don't have that return profile, like a lot of the big, you know, gold, gold and silver producers and their problems are a little bit different actually, because they're trying to replace ounces on a declining, on a, a declining asset. So this is a different area of, um, stock investment that tends to tend to do very well for investors, especially when we have a rising gold and silver price environment, which, which talking about the macro, we think that we're going to have. And, and, and in my view, real quickly, I don't think this summer is going to be quite the fade that we tend to get sometimes in gold market because of those macroeconomic factors. I think we're going to do pretty well. And so I think that we're going to see a rebound in some of these gold and silver development mining companies. I think the indexes are going to start to tick back up. We, we saw, John, a little bit of that leading up to this year. We saw some renewed interest in the in the Huey and the GDX, for example. What's your view on, on investors getting back into the equity space? It typically, it seems like the gold price leads there. But once gold looks like it's going to go on another, a little bit of a run, it seems like people then pile into the equity space. Is that is that your view on how that works? Yeah, we, we've had um, a couple of head fakes this year with gold depreciating um, through $2,000 per ounce, which seems to be a psychological barrier for, uh, for, for investors. However, as we, um, we go through the, the quiet summer season, um, as you know, inflation starts to um, moderate to some degree, and we see a little bit of a deceleration in the US dollar, which has been you know, just a very, very strong asset class over the last, call it 12 months or more, I think we will start to see a renewed interest in the, the precious metals and overall resource um, sector of, uh, of our market. So that'll bold very well for, for companies like Rockridge. Um, I also, I wanted to just go back to something that you said about the right time to invest. If I take off my CEO cap and I mm -hmm. put on my investor cap for just a second, what I really, really like about the setup for a company like Rockridge right now is that you do have um, underlying value, some like some hard value to hang your hat on while you wait and anticipate um, for exciting drill results to come back to the market potentially. And what I mean by that is, you know, the focus right now is on rainy, but we have a backstop in valuation with our project in Saskatchewan, Knife Lake, where there is greater than 200 million pounds of copper. That is a real hard asset and hard value in the market where the value is not being ascribed, but it's there, it's tangible. It's something that investors can really point to. And like I use the term, hang their hats on. And if you look at some of the other, um, um, some of the other companies in Saskatchewan, if you just go south, um, uh, about a hundred kilometers um, as the crow flies, you'll see Malkavana Bay. And the reason I point out Macavana Bay, it's it's an asset that is being developed into a mine as, at present by a company called Foran. And Foran has really shined a very bright light on this part of the uh, of, of the country. And they're building the first market neutral VMS deposit mine, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in you know ever. And a lot of capital, um, sophisticated capital, has come into that project. For example, uh, Fairfax Financial, which is a very well-known outfit here out of Toronto, um, run by Prem Watsa, they put $100 million plus of, of capital into developing and advancing that mine, plus some of the very large um, pension plans here in, in the country who are very supportive of that asset. So um, I just, I wanna highlight the value in our Rockridge um, Knife Lake project, which is 100% owned, as a backstop in valuation, something where investors can really um, feel comfortable with 
if they're getting excited about uh, the Rainy Gold project. So let's talk a little bit about Knife Lake because you have Rainy, which is the gold one, which is yeah. you know in that great, great district. That's where you're probably going to get a lot of your growth as a company as that news comes out and people get excited. But like you said, you have an existing polymetallic project, has some gold, it's copper, it's got some other things in it. Talk a little bit about that because really, I mean, if you're looking at current valuation, I would look at this and say, that, you know, this is where you're going to get the bulk of your current valuation. Rainy's really going to be a lot of your growth as well. I mean, is that the right characterization? So it, it depends um, on how the investor wants to look at the company. But in yeah. aggregate, I would say the vast majority of the, the value inside this company, although not being reflected um, in the current market cap, which seems to be um, an issue for many junior resource companies today, mm -hmm. the vast majority of the value does reside today in Knife Lake. I look at um, Rainy as um, a valuable asset, but um, more like uh, a, an option, a call option for investors, right? So you have your mm -hmm. fundamental value in Knife, plus you have a lot of blue sky and a lot of growth potential at Rainy. So you have, um, so let's go back to Knife Lake for a second. We're greater than 200 million pounds of copper mm -hmm. at surface. We believe it's a remobilized um, VMS um, deposit. And what I mean by that is these types of deposits, they tend to occur in clusters. Um, Knife Lake, we do not believe is one off. So we do think that there is significant um, exploration potential to make new discoveries, much in the same way that Knife Lake was discovered many, many years ago. There's 11 high priority exploration targets that have been discovered on our property so far. And I should also point out that it is one of the largest land holdings of a junior resource company in the province of, in the province of Saskatchewan with greater than 55,000 hectares. Um, we are located in an area where there is reasonably good infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of things to really like about Knife Lake and the value proposition within Rockridge. So let's talk about that. I'm, I'm going to pull up a slide from your deck, which looks at your peers in terms of valuation, specifically with North American copper and develop, yeah. exploration and development companies. Talk about this chart and why this is important for investors to understand the hidden value in your company that can be unlocked as you develop these projects. Yeah, absolutely. So here you're seeing, this is a bit dated. So I just want your audience to, to be aware of that. It needs to, to be updated, but once updated, I, I mean, this, this doesn't change very much. Yeah. If you look, here are um, a set of North American copper um, exploration peers, and you can see the range in values going anywhere from greater than 20 cents all the way down to you know less than a penny per share. Rockridge, um, although trending towards the, the right-hand side of the valuation curve on this chart, still trades for a very sizable discount to some of its uh, exploration peers which we don't think is, is appropriate um, in this environment. So trading you know, at around one, one and a half per cents per pound on an enterprise value to total resource um, basis, undervalues um, you know, Knife Lake and Rockridge you know, mm -hmm. by anywhere from five to 10 to 10 X conservatively. And so if and when the market starts to um, realize the value potential, um, which includes the resource, the deposit, and the exploration upside, we believe that that disconnect between you know, our value and the value of some of our peers will start to narrow and be more reflected in the share price. Yeah, so that's a great thing about your companies. You have two projects. And the key for uh, exploration companies to kind of reach that next tier and valuations in, in capturing that from the market is to have more than one project. The single project companies sort of reach, I think, a cap in their potential in terms of what they're trading relative to uh, the valuation of assets they have in the ground. And there's a discount if you're a single project company. You guys have multiple projects and the market tends to look on that very favorably. When you have multiple projects, you tend to get a higher valuation relative, you know, your market cap relative to ounces in the ground and your net asset value. So just from an accounting perspective or a valuation perspective, companies that have more than one project tend to get bid up more than companies that are just focusing on a single one. So I think you have that working to your advantage. And the fact that you have multiple metals in there gives you a lot of optionality, depending on how the economy is doing. You know, gold and copper a lot of times will do well together, but during certain aspects of the economic cycle, one will do better than the other. So you've got that optionality there as well. So 
it seems like you guys are pretty well positioned for what's coming forward in terms of, I think, the increase in the gold price because of the economic dislocations we have. But but once the economies get sorted, you've got this copper project that's going to feed into this just enormous copper demand. Uh, the, the projections I've seen over the next 20, 10 to 20 years are that we're going to have a severe deficit of copper due to industrialization going on, particularly in the Asian world, but also, and people aren't talking about this, but Africa, a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative that China's building is an, is building up those African nations and their trade, and they're going to need to electrify. And I know people personally that are working on elect electrification and internet projects throughout Africa to, to bring that those countries up to standard with the Western world so that we can build these trade networks. And a lot of that copper is going to go into building Africa as well. So if you look at all those projections, copper is going to be, there's going to be this huge demand over the next five to 10 to 20 years for it. And I really see that any company which has a sizable copper project really looking at, you know, outstanding or outsized valuations in the future compared to what, what we're looking at right now. So I, I would agree with everything that you said, although um, I don't believe that you need to buy into the demand story that you just suggested for copper price to really respond. In fact, I think the demand um, variable is the less known of the two variables um, that you can really you can really bank on as an investor in base metal, specifically copper uh, companies. Um, it's the supply side, which really um, has um, people like myself really worried. Uh, we haven't had an investment in new supply or existing mines for a, like a, an incredibly long period of time. If you go back to the early 2020s, we experienced this as well. So the preceding years or decade through the 90s through the early 2000s, there was also an environment where very little capex was spent on the advancement of new base metal projects globally. And once you had that resurgence or that surge in economic activity, predominantly in places like China and India, we couldn't, um, we couldn't catch up with, with that demand because there was just not enough supply. And you had that squeeze, um, and you had that squeeze and prices responded accordingly. And if you remember, that was really the last big move in the price of copper and most base metals. And so I think that that's shaping up to happen again as we go, go through um, the midpoint of this decade into the next decade. And so supply really seems to be the, the driving factor for, you know, my enthusiasm for, uh, for for the price of copper going forward. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, and I would extend that to the whole commodities complex because I, I would I would agree there's not enough development of gold, silver projects, uh, copper, uh, lithium needs development, molly needs development. All, all of these projects need development. And, and overall, in the last 10 years, we just haven't seen it. I think 2011 was the last time when I looked at junior minor financing, when I said, okay, we've got enough financing in there to build these projects. Since 2011, it's fallen down. And a lot of times that index has been at half in terms of new money coming in uh, to that, to that, especially the junior miners, but the whole mining complex of what we had, you know, the last time gold did well. And so I'm really looking to gold to kind of lead that money back in the commodities complex. And I think us having a really good solid gold price is going to help. And we need it. There's a lot, there's going to be a lot, John, I think, pent up demand for actual commodity assets that is going to force money to have to go into there when we start getting in these shortages. We know Silver Institute is saying there's a huge shortage of silver. We know that there's a huge shortage of copper coming down the pike. We've got the gold cliff coming in 2028 for gold. So there needs to be more money going into these projects because it takes several years, as you you highlight at the beginning of the presentation, to really build these companies up. So companies like yours who are actually in that space already developing their projects, when we hit these supply issues, you guys are, it's going to bid up the valuations for companies that actually have it and have been developing it. So getting back into timing, now is the timing if you want to get in some of these investments earlier on because you're going to have more growth in your investment. And I think the, the supply and demand profiles are speaking very positively to the commodities. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, in this interview, John, something interesting we talked about before, which is talking about the change in the economic makeup and particularly the introduction of AI. And I think you had some interesting thoughts on AI and how it's going to replace certain jobs and maybe lead to interest in others. Why don't you take a moment to kind of explore that and maybe how that could affect Rockbridge resources and commodity companies in general? It's so interesting that we're going to try to make a connection between artificial intelligence and, and resource investing, but but I think there is a very big uh, correlation between the two. So if uh, investors have been paying attention to the macro environment um, recently and reading the financial press, there's been a lot of focus on AI, artificial intelligence in, in recent months, if not in the past few years. You've seen companies like NVIDIA like really take off their chip manufacturers and a lot of their demand is coming from the AI space. 
and what AI is is going to uh, potentially do, it's it's going to replace um, a lot of areas of the labor force within you know many important sectors of our economy. And I think where it's going to leave um, leave us very vulnerable is in areas of like primary labor markets, you know, the areas of the markets that construct, that build, that develop um, real world um, assets, which is something that isn't going to go away any anytime soon. And so what AI is going to do while replacing, you know, jobs like software developers, um, engineers, um, and more, and, you know, accounting and parts of our legal profession, you know, we're, we're going to see this void that's being created in the primary sectors of our economy that are going to be in desperate need for, for growth. And I think that as, um, as that void um, is, is filled, it's going to, you know, take uh, take its toll on the, the supply and demand um, imbalances in the resource markets. And once we, uh, we, we, you know, we realize that we don't have the right type of labor force to go and, and develop and build and, and create um, hard assets, you know, around the world, I think it's going to continue to, um, to exasperate, you know, the, the supply um, situation for, for resources, which for companies like Rockridge is going to be quite uh, quite impactful. And one thing uh, to add to that, those are all very good points. One thing I want to add to that is if you're young and, and considering investing in this space, know that there are a lot of young people coming into it because of the technology. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to mention it. When I have conversations in mining companies, a, a lot of the people getting into geology and in the mining space, or especially younger generations, are attracted by the technology and the opportunities that that offers. And there are wonderful new technologies coming out that are helping companies mine, define resources, to do it a little bit cleaner, more efficient, and better that I think that the younger generations are really going to get into. And we've seen the last couple of years some influx in people into these, you know, geology professions that will eventually go in, into that space because of tech. They're being drawn because of tech. So I think it's a very big draw for the younger crowd to get into it, which is very encouraging because I think that's also going to bring some investment into the space as they begin talking to their friends about, hey, yeah, I work for this mining company. We're doing this really cool, you know, geographical imaging project using tech and we're finding resources. And I think that's going to bring sort of a new generation into it. And I think that's an interesting angle if you're young and you're looking to get into the space. Uh, John, any last thoughts on Rockridge Resources before we wrap up this interview? Yeah, no, I, I just I wanted to to point out the excitement that that we have around the Rainy Gold project. That's mm -hmm. uh, that exploration is happening in real time now, and we'll have results, um, you know, throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to launch the second phase of uh, of that exploration uh, program. Plus, you know, our, our focus uh, is always on uh, Knife Lake and growing the the value proposition in in that project. Um, the value is uh, it will be surfaced in companies like Rockridge over time, and now is a an incredibly exciting time for investors to uh, sharpen their pencils and get acquainted acquainted with little companies like Rockridge. So super excited there. Um, you know, our market cap is you know under five million for you know two high quality assets here in Canada. One which is going to be very news uh, newsworthy over the next couple of weeks. So that's. Um, those are my final comments on, on Rockridge and uh, really, really happy that I had the opportunity to sit down with you and, and chat about all of these topics today. Yeah, us as well. And we're definitely going to be following your stock uh, going forward because I love projects like this in which you have so many factors kind of de-risked or, you know, they're not new where you're going exploring for the first time. You don't know. You've got a lot of known factors here in terms of the project, in terms of some major results. And so you guys are sort of on target with what you're looking for. And these are the type of projects when we get into the beginning of a commodities bull market that I look for, because this is where you're going to get your explosion. It's not only the fact that the, the underlying commodities are going to do well and it's going to pull up valuations of companies. It's that you find companies that are undervalued, but they're doing good work. And that those companies are going to have uh, an extra bit of boost as the market finds out about them. And certainly the market's going to find out about yours. So thank you for joining to us on the program, John. We appreciate it. And we'll definitely have you back on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for watching. We selected these videos just for you. Check them out. And remember, $4.99 a month keeps the lights on and the channel going. So join our Gold Silver Pro supporter membership. We appreciate your support. Keep stacking.